Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Tonight's Journey Home is a special episode of in effect, may be the start of a number of episodes like this. It's something that I've thought about doing for a long time. We've been doing this program now for, whoa, about 24 years. And those of you especially are, who are regular uh, viewers have heard many stories of men and women who've, who've, dis, who've uh, had a deep conversion to Jesus Christ and, and in the process eventually discovered the Catholic Church or other guests were brought up Catholic and then had left, and then often after uh, an awakening to Jesus Christ, felt a draw back to the church. And these guests over the years have come from a great number of, of non-Catholic traditions, as you know that. And uh, in our own large database, the Coming Home Network's large database of converts and reverts to the church, inquirers to the church, uh, we see uh, people coming from over a hundred different denominations. But, but what I've wanted to do over the years is to invite back guests to talk about specifically, given their denominational background, two questions, and this is what we're going to do tonight, two questions. For that person's denominational background, what were the main? What are the main barriers that pre prevent a person from that particular tradition to be open to the Catholic Church? And then the second question is, what is it that opens the heart of people from that tradition to the Church? And the reason I think this discussion is important is because sometimes we just lump all non-Catholics into Protestants. Well, the truth is, uh, everybody's a bit different in their theology, even within one tradition. So that the barriers that stand between an Anglican or a Presbyterian or a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Church of Christ, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, are different, nuanced, different, sometimes radically different from one another. And same thing, the things that draw people from each of those different denominations is different. So I invited tonight to join me on this program, a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, I feel like we've known each other forever, but it, we've just known each other because of our journeys to the church. And our guest tonight uh, for this first of these episodes is Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. He's been on the program a number of times, but let me run down just a little background. He's not going to give a story tonight, but Monsignor Steenson was a former Episcopal bishop before he was received into the Catholic Church in 2007. Uh, he, uh, at, in 2009, he was then ordained a Catholic priest in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. Uh, he was then appointed... And after serving a number of parishes, he's then appointed as the first ordinary of the Anglican ordinariate, the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter in 2012. He served for four years until they actually they got a bishop for the, the ordinariate. And then Monsignor uh, moved back up north where he served as a scholar in residence in the School of Divinity at St. Paul Seminary. And then he's also been teaching in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And now he serves part-time as the vice president of the Coming Home Network. And he's also my co-host on uh, a Deep in History program, which we'll talk about later. And so let me welcome to the program. Hello, Monsignor. Marcus, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it is great uh. that you would join us for this first episode, Monsignor. I, I wish we weren't separated by electronics and we could just be sitting across the table here. But Exactly, yeah. yeah. But first of all, before I get you to jump into this question, what do you think about this idea of discuss, discuss the unique barriers and the unique things that draw people into the church from, in your case, the Anglican church? No, I think, it, I think it's a wonderful idea, Marcus, not only for people that may be thinking about coming across the, the river, um, but also for Catholics to be more sensitive about the needs of um, 
of these people as they that inquire and some of them will convert. And I, I think it's a, a great idea for that. You know, I've thought about over the years, if you've listened to the Journey Home program over the years, you've heard all the different reasons that people's hearts were open to the Catholic Church. And you might just think, well, that's was unique to that person. But it also might have been because of the tradition they came from. Yes. Uh huh. That that was what opened their heart. Exactly. No, I I think um, yeah we're get to, in our program now today we'll be able to talk about some of these elements, um, and I think they'd be different from people from different uh, church traditions. What I've asked Monsignor to do is not focus on his own conversion if. If you're not familiar with his journey to the church, you can go to EWTN.com or you can go to comminghomenetwork.chnetwork.org uh, and look at the old Journey Home episode where Monsignor uh, gave his story. But what I want you to do in this first question then, Monsignor, is from your experience and studies, what would you say are the biggest barriers that stand in the way for Anglicans Episcopalians to the Catholic Church. All right, and I'll, I'll try to break that down in a couple of way, ways um, as we go along here, Marcus. So you please interrupt me with any questions or comments that you have on this as well. Um, I think the, I think honestly, the, um, the probably the biggest problem for serious Anglicans to get over is their superiority complex. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now where did that come well, from? Well, I don't know. We were we were just you know it was kind of ingrained in us that we had a superior ecclesial culture. We had the best liturgy, the best music. Well, maybe not the best music, but way up there. Um, and uh, and so there there's a. I I you know we felt very very proud about that. Um, I can remember that over the years, and and sometimes that's that can become a barrier. Um, you know, for us to say that here sounds demeaning. I thought, Monsignor, it was just things that I felt, because when I was a pastor, uh, first a Congregationalist pastor, then for many years a Presbyterian pastor, I was always a part of the old ministerial groups in the towns where I served. And so we would gather once a month with the Baptists, the I was maybe the Presbyterian and then the Assembly of God and maybe the Catholic priest would show up, but then there'd be the Episcopalian. And I always just felt that he had this attitude towards the rest of us. Well, there's honestly, there is no doubt about that. I, I can remember years ago, um, I, I was out of seminary at the time, but I was a young Episcopal priest and we got into this fascinating discussion about why um, Episcopalians make the best dry martinis on the planet. <laughs> 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 there was, and I, my first, my first um, job after I finished um, graduate school, my first pastoral calling, um, my boss said, um, one of the most important things that you need to learn as a new Episcopal priest is how to, and bar properly so you could do a proper dinner party. And I mean, you could, you could see it's, it was sort of, we laughed about it. It's kind of silly snottiness, but, um, does it, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah. does this come from historically the idea that when the, I don't know if it's, if it, this came about during the initial years of the English Reformation in the mid 1500s, but whether it developed later that the, the Church of England saw itself as going back to the, the earliest years of the church, uh, I think the first six or seven ecumenical consuls, they accepted. And so they began to see themselves uh, back in the time when the church was united, Catholics, Orthodox, and then they saw themselves in that mix. And so, therefore, they kind of presumed they preceded the 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 Continental Reformation, the yes, Germans yeah. and the Swiss. Uh, is that kind of it? Yeah. No, that's a great point. And I can remember the 
pretty vividly those days I, we spent um, in when I was in England. And uh, the attitude was that the Church of England was for, that was the national church for all the people. And um, if you opted out of that arrangement, you know, you might be a Wesleyan or a Presbyterian or something like that. Um, but it was this sense of being, you know, the church of the people, if you will, yeah. the national church. Well, and it, it, it bred a kind of arrogance, honestly. Everybody else were upstarts. Yeah. I mean, even Luther and Calvin were upstarts in a way when, when seen from that perspective. Um, and I wonder even Newman trying to clarify, here's Newman, uh, an Anglican priest in the mid 19th century, struggling with the problems of the church and, and himself being drawn to a, a higher Anglicanism, right? You know, a, a, a more traditionalist Anglicanism, but trying to justify, trying to justify, in fact, the superiority of Anglicanism as a, a via media middle place between Catholicism and all the rest of them Protestants, right? Isn't that what he was trying to argue? <clears throat> That's what he's trying to argue. And it's interesting how when, when he started to travel um, to Italy and uh, especially that early journey to Italy, I forget what the year was, but it was before his conversion. And he writes about how he was really humbled by the faith of, the, of simple Catholic people and and his that kind of superiority that he had um, had been bred with in in um, in Oxford and in that world, um, he came to repent, if you will. Yeah, I when I was in seminary, Monsignor, and you were in seminary right down the road from me at about the same yeah, time. That's we right. didn't know each that's other right. then. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. at Gordon Conwell. You were at Harvard, uh, but. My focus in my, besides pastoral ministry, I focused on the English reformers, not the, the, the 17th century Puritan reformers, like John Richard Baxter and that group of folk, um, Isaac Watts. And what's fascinating about those writers, now think about this, folks, you have the English Anglican Church being established in the 16th century, 100 years later, you have faithful, evangelical-minded pastors breaking away from the Anglican Church because it's so corrupt already. Richard Baxter writes that wonderful book, The Reformed Pastor, in which yeah. he says in there, it's a sin when a man becomes a pastor before he's converted. This is 100 years after the establishment of the church. And, you know, I'm not, I don't want us to sit here and just browbeat Anglicans for their arrogance, excuse me, you know, uh, mea culpa for my own arrogance. But I wonder if that was a part of even the culture that infiltrated um, early into the ministry. It did, you know, just um, down the street from where you went to seminary, where I was a seminarian, I remember, um, we, we had a wonderful pastor there, um, Father Jim Hampson, who I, I can remember a homily he gave about how he, he he kind of gave you a little biography of his life. And, and he was baptized. He was confirmed. He was married. He was ordained. And then he became a Christian. I, well, yeah, boy, that gets me into a lot of other discussions we could get into because, <laughs> um, because sometimes for Anglicans coming towards the Catholic Church, even, it often, I got to be careful here, it often isn't a deeper walk with Christ, but it's more liturgy or some of these, more of the externals than... And it's not always true. You know, we make sure on the guests in our program talk about our Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. But sometimes that could be a struggle. Oh, there's 
And, and it is, you know, that was one of the things I put on my list today to talk about um, the barriers that Anglicans sometimes experience. And the liturgy is, is one of those things that um, can be sometimes off-putting. Um, okay. You know, that if there's one thing an Episcopalian was taught to be proud of, it was, it was the liturgy. Um, and there was, at least in the higher tradition, not necessarily Anglo-Catholic tradition, but the high Anglican tradition, the cathedral type worship. Um, it was it was beautiful. The the texts were wonderful. The hymnody, um, the organ music was stunning. And then um, and then you c- contemplate becoming a, a Catholic, a Roman Catholic, and um, it's a different experience liturgically. Yeah, any of you um, Anglicans yeah. watching us, you may we, we're not trying to nail you down. We're trying to, uh, and I was never an yeah. Anglican, so I got to be careful here. But it, wasn't it Cranmer that put together the Book of Common Prayer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember you. I've joked with you that in the process of doing that, when he copied over the virtues, he got them backwards. <laughs> So oh, that, right. it, it, right. it, in a sense, the oh. the the worst vice became humility, and the highest virtue became pride, the stiff upper lip, and you see that a bit in, in English culture oh. anyway. But that isn't alone an Anglican issue. We, we we certainly see that in other traditions. But I think you're witnessing to that. You're talking to liturgy. What other things would you say are barriers for Anglicans? You know, just getting beyond themselves, but also the liturgy. Yeah, well, I think another thing that um, that we had to really struggle with I, um, is the attitude that we had that the nature of the Catholic Church was that it was uh, uh, basically a worldwide federation of national churches. And so... Um, Anglican apologists develop what what we sometimes call the branch theory hmm. um, that there are there are many branches of the Catholic Church and they all lead back to the apostles. Um, that that theory uh, has a hard time sometimes um, acknowledging that that everything is rooted in Peter um, and comes from you know that and Peter and his successors. So that. That um, that's a big problem. Um, I remember we were taught um, as Anglicans that uh, toward this branch theory idea is that when Christ made that commission to Peter, what was entrusted to Peter was entrusted to all the apostles. And so... Uh, using that analogy and carrying it forward, then um, it's not the Bishop of Rome, but all the bishops together who represent um, the apostolic authority in the church. So it was this idea that why would we become Catholic since we're already Catholic? And to me, that just points out the problem of of interpretation of scripture, because you can have a, a, a solid scriptural foundation for an idea, but is that the correct interpretation or is it a new interpretation? And you're, uh, Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson's my guest, those of you listening on radio, and uh, your, your strength is in training is in patristics. And often the problems in the early church with the different heresies was a battle between this is what it says in the Bible versus this is what we've received from the apostles or this is what the present Bishop of Rome and those gathered around him are saying, right? There was a battle between how do you interpret that, that scripture? Well, sure. And, you know, and Marcus, I'm not sure how exactly to put this. Um, but uh, from a point from the point of view of patristic study, the the um, primacy of the Roman See wasn't so clear in the early centuries, and um, 
Uh, we were, you and I have been talking a little bit about this with our Irenaeus podcast um, as well. The, what is kind of ironical about uh, this whole story is that the first time that it's specifically mentioned that the Bishop of Rome um, sees himself as a successor of St. Peter, just like that, came from his opponents. And we find it in the letters of St. Cyprian. So, um, so, and that was mainly the Eastern churches complaining about um, the Bishop of Rome imposing um, pastoral discipline in, term, and in terms of what do we do receiving back heretics and schismatics into the church. And they objected to, to um, Pope Stephen being so imperious about um, the decrees that he put forward about that. Yeah, the, uh, I, I've often read in uh, historians will say, you'll quote somebody, fourth century, and say, well, this is the first time that this belief was created or coined or whatever word, you know. When in truth, no, that's the earliest record we have of it, but that doesn't mean it's the way people believed. They may have been yeah. believing that for a hundred years before that, but it just happens to be the first record we have, of earliest record we have of something. And Monsignor and I are doing a, a weekly podcast We'll talk about it in the second half of the program of Irenaeus' wonderful book Against Heresies that was published in 175 AD. I mean, that's exciting to think about yeah. that. But there are things he says in there that may be one of the earliest rec records in the history of the church when it's said, but the way he says it implies that this is what they always accept. It's not new. Uh, this is what was passed on from Christ to his apostles as the apostolic deposit of faith, the core of what we believe. No, I, I, we should probably acknowledge, too, the importance of um, blessed, Saint, blessed John Henry Newman on this as well. well actually, no, St. John Henry Newman. Right, that's right. Um, between his Anglican period and when he became Catholic, in that transition, he wrote his essay on the development of doctrine. And I think that's very important, honestly, for um, people that are trying to think their way into the Catholic Church from Anglicanism. Um, because, it, you know, if you just kind of look at it from a, a, a point of view that um, if what that, that everything has always been the same from the beginning. Uh, honestly, it hasn't been. It, there's been some kind of development going on. And, and so all of the things that will come later in the Catholic tradition are, well, they're not new things, but they're developed or unfolded out of, out of the deposit. Um, these initially can be quite um, serious stumbling blocks for um for potential converts from Anglicanism to the Catholic Church. The Marian dogmas, for instance, um, uh, papal, um, papal primacy is not so terribly hard, but papal infallibility is a more serious problem to resolve. Um, and, and what Newman did, I think, was incredibly important to help many of us um, well, we're faced with moral yeah. issues today that people even a hundred years ago couldn't imagine. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing in the apostolic deposit of faith that dealt with in vitro fertilization. So what do we do? Well, the church, as it says in the very first statement in the catechism, the responsibility of the church is the guarding of the deposit has to gather the magisterium in union with the successor of Peter to discern how do we take scripture, which is a part of the apostolic deposit of faith and the tradition we've received and apply it to what's going on today. And that's what Vatican II was, was all about. You know, Monsignor, the, the moral issue comes up 
And I'm wondering, even as a barrier to many Anglicans, I mean, the Catholic Church has stood really strong on some moral issues that the Anglican and Episcopal Church haven't. Is that a barrier to Anglicans? Um, it, it can be, of course. Um, when some of that stuff comes up, though, um, it's sometimes helpful just to sit down with um, people that have those questions and remind them that that uh, Anglicans had similar views about things like contraception um, in the, you know, not that long ago, right. you know, in the 1920s, say, um, there was unanimity that those things kind of got changed um, in the later part of the 20th century. Yeah, well, so I'm wondering if yeah. the idea as a Catholic, we recognize the authority of the magisterium in union with the successor of Peter as the final word on issues of faith and morals. Well, in the Anglican Church, that isn't exactly the model, is it? No. No. Um, yeah, that's another thing that I, I put down on my list um, as well. There's a, a strong sense that um, an individual has the right to, um, you know, um, at the end of the day, the individual is supreme in his in his or her judgments, um, and that's a. I think that's a big big barrier to overcome. Though, you know, the other thing, Marcus, that I remember um, in that year that I was preparing for ordination as a Catholic, um, I, I I can remember I they sent up they sent me off to Seton Hall. Um, to Immaculate Conception Seminary, just to uh, basically be um, quizzed about where I was, what my theological formation was all about. And then they would make some recommendations about what I should work on for my studies. And it was canon law and moral theology. And, and <laughs> I can remember one of the professors at, at, at the seminary saying, well, that makes sense because everybody knows that Anglicans are are um, immoral and lawless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was teasing, of course, but but the moral theology question is a real significant one, I think, for people that are seriously trying to think their way in. Because um, in the in the Anglican tradition, there's a kind of pragmatism that that you don't find in the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church is a, a realistic um, moral theology. It's based yeah. on um, it's based on being faithful to the commandments of God and that moral theology is a, a way to make that um, pathway, you know, clear. And whereas um, whereas in in you know in Anglican moral theology, there's a kind of pragmatic approach, if you will. I remember the, the second guest that I had on the journey home was the former Bishop of London, Graham Leonard. Graham Leonard, loved him. God bless him. You know, and, you know, I, I don't remember all of his journey, but one of the issues as a Bishop of London, starting to wonder what was his authority? When, when the Lambeth Conference would gather every year and then it would, democratic theology would vote on whether a woman could be ordained or whatever, and he had really no authority. And that was one of the issues on this issue of morality, you know, where, where is it decided? And we're going to take a break now, but I just want to say that, you know, we recognize in the Catholic Church that the Church says in the Vatican II documents that our are baptized non-Catholic non Christian brothers and sisters by the mercy of God can receive the graces and, and, and be saved outside the church. We recognize that, saved through the church, though not fully of it. But that's not meaning we don't proclaim the beauty of the church to them because outside the church, how can they be sure that in their areas of morality or teaching, doctrine, that they're 
they're going in the right direction or just following their own gut feelings. And that's why we want them to be a part of the family. I, oh, I, Marcus, I remember when I was a, a pastor in an Episcopal congregation, I would, I would have the writings of John Paul II on my shelf and I would work with those. And many times I would take my homilies from them. And I remember one guy came in, coming up to me one day saying, well, that was an interesting sermon, but remember, that's just your opinion. <laughs> that that's really for any Protestant minister, you know, that really is a coming up short moment because, um, you know, we we strive to preach from the truth and to have it kind of just um, passed off as your personal opinion. You end up feeling impotent when that happens and you yeah. get in the pulpit and you try and tell the people you call them to to holy lives and they say, well, that's just your opinion. And even if you said, well, no, that's what it says right here. That's what it says in the Bible. Well, that's yeah. just your interpretation of it. I see that's it differently. Right. Well, Monson, let's take a break. We'll come back and when okay. we get back, we want to talk about what are the things that open the heart to Anglicans, to the Catholic Church. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home, this special edition of The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. We've been talking about unique barriers that stand in the way of Anglicans to consider the Catholic Church. And now for the rest of the program, I want to focus on, well, what are the things that break through those barriers and awaken Anglicans to the Church? And I know you had a list, Monsignor, but before we get to that list, I want to draw back. We, we we were brutal to Anglicans. You were brutal to Anglicans about their, you called them arrogant and, and, and you've come was, from there. That's because I was brutal with myself. Okay. That's what I wanted and to do. I hope the audience yeah. knows that. But, yeah. Yeah. And I thought about that a little bit during our break and I realized that th there's a sense in which many non-Catholic Christians, and it can be true of Catholic priests and bishops too, is that, but I remember as a Protestant minister, really thinking, you know, I've got the scriptures and I, and I know what it says. And so I can get up in that pulpit and I can proclaim what's true. And, and there could be a sense of blind arrogance about that, blindness to, to, to one's own blindness. And as I thought about that, Monsignor reminded me of that beautiful scripture uh, from 2 Chronicles 7. That says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, when I think about the barrier of self-centered arrogance that might be there for anyone, not just Anglican, but anyone that stands in the way, the only thing that can break through that is grace. And that draws us to do just what that passage says, humble ourselves, pray, get on our knees, seek God's face, so as you think about the things drawing people to church, talk about, first of all, the work of grace. Oh, no, I think so. And I, if I could just add a, 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 an autobiographical note about it. Um, for Anglican clergy that become Catholic, one of the hardest things to do is to pick up a pen and write a letter of resignation and renounce your orders in, in the Anglican church, at least in the Episcopal church that was required. So there's a all that you work for in your younger life, you basically have to leave that all behind. Yeah. And um, you know, I remember when you asked me yeah. to speak at a retreat for Anglican converts mm -hmm. for the ordinariate, and I gave a talk on the the parable in Luke about the wedding feast. Remember, we talked about that. And one of the problems, not just for Anglicans, but for any non-Catholic clergyman that comes into the church, sometimes they, they think, well, okay, I was a minister for 20 years, and, and so how do I come into the new church at the same level that I was at before? You know, I was a branch manager before. Well, how do I come in and be a branch manager in a Catholic church? What does Jesus say? 
You don't come in and take the front row seat. You take the back row seat. That's right. Oh, that that word of the Lord has been so precious over the years. I think we could all benefit so much if we just think about that, deliberately think when we walk into a room, look at, look for the simplest, humblest seat in the place. What are some yeah. other things, Monsignor, then, besides the work of grace that awakens us, what are the things that open hearts? Well, certainly for, for Anglicans, um, it is uh, the sense that uh, we've already had the sense that um, we have a, a tradition that's older than the Reformation. Yeah. That, that's very, very important. For, I think for, for all the converts from Anglicanism that come over, that's very precious. Like the Venerable Bede uh, wrote about how Pope Gregory the Great commissioned um, Augustine, the monk, to go to England. He became Augustine of Canterbury um, and gave, gave him a pallium. So, and the pallium represents the authority of an archbishop. So basically, Augustine was charged with founding a church in, in Britain. And we felt that we were part of that church. Yeah. So I think the you know, the early church is a very, very precious part of us. Um, and I guess I'm going to point to John Henry Newman again. Newman again. Um, the more that you love the fathers of the church, the more that you want to, to walk with them. And I remember Newman talked about how, you know, when he became a Catholic, his relationship to the fathers of the church changed. Yeah. They were not, they were now in a, in a whole different sense, brothers in the faith and fathers in the faith to him. But that, I think that openness to, to the early tradition is a very important Thing that helps us along the journey. Monsieur, I mentioned earlier that, and you did too, that you and I do this podcast on Irenaeus's wonderful book Against Heresies. He wrote this, he was a bishop of uh, Lyon, and he yep. wrote the book in, published it in 175 AD. Think about that, folks. That's like 140 years or so after the resurrection, ascension of our Lord Jesus. So it's very early. And to me, I love doing this book, and I hope everybody, if you're interested, go to chnetwork.org and you can find our Deep in History podcast. But to me, that's an example, Monsignor, of, of why going back to the early church fathers, whether you're an Anglican or any non-Catholic traditions, awakens you to the church. Because, for example, when you read Irenaeus, he is completely convinced without apology in the real presence of the body and blood, soul and divinity in the Eucharist. And he's not as if he's creating it. This He's defending on the fact this is the tradition that he received. And all the early church fathers are united in that. So as a modern, when you go back and read it, you ask the question, well, which side would I be on? Would I be on the side with Irenaeus and and Ignatius and Justin Martyr or Clement, would I be on that side or would I be one of these other guys challenging it, Monsignor? Oh, no, that's right. When we've been doing this podcast, I keep thinking about how those Gnostics, some of the their attitudes about the Eucharist or the, the implications of their faith about the Eucharist um, uh, are haunting because they're so modern. Yeah. We have the same challenges today like that. You know, in, in Anglicanism, that was one of the things that was so um, hard sometimes to, to deal with is that you ha we were all over the board on the question of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, you know, some of the, on the more evangelical side saw it as, um, they were even lower than, than Luther. They were Zwinglian in their attitude yeah. about the Eucharist, just a symbol. You know? Just a symbol. You know? Yeah. Well, doesn't the thirty-nine articles forbid the belief in the real presence? Um, well, I'm a <laughs> Newman tried to defend that. So. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't an Anglican. I'm just you know yeah. secondhand here. 
Yeah. What other? But I mean, I did. We, you know, we didn't. I and I have to say, and I think many Anglicans would would agree with me on this too. Um, we truly did believe in the real presence. Whether our beliefs were secure or not, that's a different question. But um, but yeah. um, I was brought up Lutheran, and we yeah. believed in believed in the real presence. And I'll yeah. often get emails from viewers, Anglican viewers, uh, that will say, "I'm an Anglican. I believe in the real presence." And and my point is, um, what do you base it on? You know, is it just, as you said earlier, just individual yep. interpretation? Is that all that it matters? Or is there an authority that determines what is true about? No, oh, that's true. Person? Like if you, you know, we used to joke um, a few years ago anyway, if you wanted the most low church version of what Anglicans believe about the Eucharist, go to church in Sydney, Australia. Um, or, <laughs> or, or if you want the most high church, um, probably come to one of the Episcopal church parishes, if you will, but, you know, so everybody was all over the board and, and that was, it was lacking that sort of center. Um, yeah. And now we, we need to pray yeah. for our Anglican brothers and sisters because they are struggling about orthodoxy within Anglicanism. And, you know, we know some pastors, Monsignor, who have left different branches of Anglicanism, are now part of branches that come out of Africa because those branches of Anglicanism are trying to hold true to the faith. Um, and they can be in a city with another Anglican, both Anglican church, but believing radically different things. Oh, it gets so confusing. I've lost track of the number of Anglican groups now, um, but they were upwards of 50, I think, when I last was tracking it. So what other things would you say open the hearts of Anglicans? Well, I, I think, um, again, I just want to, again, reiterate the whole question of, um, finding common ground in the early church. Okay. Um, we, you know, I, I quoted, or I cited that Bede's story about how uh, Gregory sent Augustine. I just wanted to quote one more thing here. Um, St. Irenaeus, book three, chapter three. <laughs> He's trying to give all these lists, you know, of um, how apostolic succession works in the various churches. And he said, we could be here forever. Let's just cut to the quick. It is necessary that all churches be in accord with the Church of Rome on account of her more excellent apostolic foundations, yeah, yeah. being the church of where Peter and Paul laid down their lives. Yeah. Um, that, that text has great power to move people. Um, I mean, there are, you know, they, that will help people come get through a lot of the struggles they have, you know, in terms of dealing with a, a different church culture that, that, the Roman Catholic Church sometimes represents for Anglicans. But um, all of us in the whole, I mean, really, when you think about it, all of us in the that come from any of the Protestant traditions, where did we get our faith from? Missionaries yeah. that came from Rome or were, were sent from Rome mostly, you know. Here's a good example, Mons, uh, Monsignor, that what draws Anglicans might be different from others because, for example, arguing with an Anglican about the inadequacies of sola scriptura may not be an issue for an Anglican. Because for Anglicans, they already accept the reality of tradition yeah. and scripture. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that maybe pointing out, how do you know your tradition is trustworthy? is more of a, an approach to an Anglican than the issue of scripture. Oh, that's absolutely correct. That's, ab that's absolutely correct. And when you think about how um, the church, the Anglican churches have changed their teaching on so many fundamental questions over the years, yep. I think people are very unnerved by that sort of thing. You know, Marcus, I remember as a, as a graduate student, um, I was in love with 
things Catholic, but I was encouraged to hold back and don't don't become a Catholic yet because you know we're the union between Anglicanism and the Catholic Church is just over the horizon. That was right out, you know, um, in the years after Vatican II, um, when, um, oh, I mean, a wonderful encounter in Rome, I think it was in 1966 or something like that, where Michael Ramsey met, Archbishop Ramsey met with Paul VI, and Paul VI took off his ring and gave it to him. And they, you know, from, and they started something called the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission at that time. Oh. And so in those early years, um, we were all very hopeful that that unity was just around the corner. Corporate unity was just around the corner, and it, it just didn't happen. You know, another area I'd like to ask you about, and then we got an email, we're trying to get that in too. I, I remember when I was studying the biography of the first American-born Protestant minister convert who became a priest, John Thayer. Hopefully I'll get that book published someday. I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking it. forward to that. I've, yeah. I've been working on it forever, you know. But he was a congregational minister, and when he went to uh, Europe right after the Protestant, I mean, yeah, right after the American Revolution, the last thing on his mind was ever even to consider the Catholic Church. And the first thing that opened his mind were the miracles that happened around the death of St. Benedict Joseph of Bray in Rome. But in many ways, the main thing that awakened him to the church was the faith of Catholics that he encountered. Because being brought up in America, he had never met a Catholic. But he met Catholics in France and then in Italy and he was moved by their faithfulness. I think the true same was true for Newman. Oh yes, for Newman it was, yeah. Is this true for Anglicans? I think so. You know what, I, I remember as a young man walking into a Catholic parish and looking at, at ordinary people coming in and praying, and it left an incredible impression on me where, you know, we, I mean, people prayed, of course, in the in the Protestant churches as well, but not it was not in the same way. And yeah. um, to see people just kneeling, praying in quiet in a parish church somewhere had a great impact on, on me. My, my wife, when I was a Protestant pastor, a little country church, she was the director of the local uh, pro-life center. And I remember we were the last thing we were thinking about is the Catholic Church. But I remember her t being so impressed by the Catholics that came to defend life. Yeah. And, you know, Catholics, what does that if we want to reach out to our, our Anglican Episcopalian friends and family, uh, you know, I mean, we can read the early church fathers, lots of things, but they're looking at us, right? They're looking at us and our lives. Are we living our faith? Are we a good example that would draw them to the church? Um, yeah, and if they live, you know, when Catholics live out their faith in a public way, well, that's an incredible witness and uh, you know, how do how how will we ever know the impact that has? Just simple people being faithful to their faith, yep. the the witness that that represents one of the most important things. Let's take this email. Yeah. Monsignor Cindy from Wyoming writes, from the perspective of a former Episcopalian, how do you think converts from an Episcopal background can help enrich and bring new life into the Catholic Church? Oh, so a wonderful question from Cynthia it is, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a wonderful question. Well, that was, that was of course, Pope Benedict's vision for um, the, the ordinariates was that they would bring um, the best of Anglican, of the Anglican tradition with them, and it would enrich the life of the Catholic Church um, in terms of, especially in terms of worship, liturgy, and things like that. That was the... <laughs> 
the patrimony. Sort of that was the patrimony. That yeah, was... the patrimony, right, yeah. Um, so those are things that um, I think are very important. Um, the, I think, you know, the, the pastoral style is another thing that's, you know, because, you know, I'm not just Anglicans, but Protestant clergy tend to be far more, they tend to be close, more closely involved with their, with their parishioners. Yeah. I don't know. I don't mean that as in a critical way, but it's just, the, it's just a, a different tradition. And I think that's, a, it's an important thing to bring that forward too. Hmm. We've got a, just a couple minutes left, Monsignor. If you were to talk about the necessity of our uh, the need for our Anglican brothers and sisters to come home, you know, if you were to put down well, you know, what what's a main reason? Uh, we're not standing in judgment of their salvation. That's not what we're talking about here. But but why do we want them? Because don't they already have the sacraments? <laughs> well, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> we probably don't want to go there. But you know what the church teaches? You know uh, the was very clear about this, um, obey your conscience. And if your conscience is leading you, you if you, your conscience is leading you to come into the Catholic Church, you have to obey it. You must obey it. If you don't, hmm. there's darkness. Um, and uh, so I think that's one thing I'd want to really emphasize. I, uh, well, and in, in, in that vein... You know, yeah. you follow a formed conscience. So I'm thinking particularly to Anglicans, Episcopalians, a gift of the catechism might be a good start. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, because there's nothing like it. We don't, we didn't have a catechism. Um, not like the Catholic catechism. That would be a wonderful gift to your friends. Um, I, I treasured mine when I was given it. I mean, in some sense, because... Yeah. The, the the Anglican Church, you say they don't have a, a catechism, but very much tradition, very much creeds, uh, a long l literary history that it seems that Anglicans particularly would be open to reading what it is that Catholic Church believes in one volume, uh, as opposed to everything that's out there. Well, here's our here's what we believe. Yeah, no, it's it's wonderful. And then um, there, the uh, the USCCB has developed the catechism a little bit more in terms of kind of making it a little bit more manageable in, ter in terms of reaching ordinary people. Um, I forget the name of that, the that edition that they've done. The compendium. Done. The compendium, that's it, yeah, yeah. which is wonderful. Um, I think that's Probably one of the great evangel evangelization gifts that we have in the in the church is that catechism. All right, Monsignor, if I could, could I yeah. ask you as we close the program for a blessing for our audience? Of course, and you know, if I could use an Anglican prayer as part okay. of this, all right? Because you know, and the ordinary, this is our tradition that we brought yeah. with. So, Lord Jesus Christ who saidst unto thine apostles, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of thy church, and grant unto it that peace and unity, which is according to thy will, who livest and reignest world without end. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. All right. Thank you, Monsignor, for joining us on this special edition of The Journey Home. And all of you, thank you for joining us. I hope this has been uh, informative for you. And it, to me, it's an encouragement to pray for our Anglican Episcopalian brothers and sisters that by the work of grace, they would be open to the fullness of the faith. God bless you. See you again next week.